Thank you very much, Mark, and again to the participants of the Rise of Africa 2016. I hear you've had a very fantastic and engaging morning, and we hope to go through the rest of the occasion with more insights, more engagements, and definitely things that would leave you with enthusiasm in regards to the Rise of Africa. I always do this, which I know is very non-traditional or non-conference style, but what I always like to do is, with permission of Mark, I have this sensitivity of knowing that I woke up this morning, so if you know that that's the greatest opportunity anybody can have, so I always like to start, especially coming from London, and when I got on the plane, I wasn't too sure whether the plane would make it to Berlin because it was all chattering, but we did. So I always like to give all honor and praise to the creator, the God of the Genesis creation, the Almighty, for giving me life this morning. And I do take that as seriously as anything else. And to all those men and women who are seeking a transformation on this earth for things which will be equitable for all humanity, I greet you all in peace. And I think that's very non-religious, and I think that's very calming. I'd like us to move straight on to our next um, very esteemed speaker. Just got to hear about her. A very, in terms of African affairs, it's one of those rare minds like a diamond that you really don't get to know until someone presents her expertise to you. Because like diamonds, if you're not an expert in diamonds, you think it's broken glass until someone begins to tell you the cuts and what it is about her. We've had, a, I think we've just met one another for the last 20 or maybe 30 minutes but it's a great pleasure to bring you one who was born from Kenya. Her parents have the experience of both Mozambique and Kenya. Um, my beloved sister Florence Tatu, um, bear me, Amimu, I hope I pronounced it well. She ho you can sit down, I'll bring you on. She would give the next presentation. I want you to listen very closely to what she would share within the short time she does give this presentation. And I'm going to preempt it. Even though you see the young, beautiful lady over here, first, she holds a degree in law and a bachelor in education from the Moore University of Kenya. She has a degree in leadership and management from St. Paul's University in Kenya. She also has a diploma in events management and planning, and also a diploma in community-based and rural app appraisal. Now, that first paragraph alone is loaded. Florence has a vast experience in business and investment consultancy. She has worked with the Office of the Prime Minister in Kenya as a gender advisor and investment advisor. She is a former managing director of Mozambique Kenya Investments. She has worked on a presidential appointment to the Women in Business Boards to the Kenyan National Chambers of Commerce and Industry. She's a former national organizing coordinator of the Labour Party in Kenya. She was the national coordinator of human rights and status of women of Soroptimist International of Europe Kenya chapter. She's also worked with projects of the UNDP and Save the Children Canada in Kenya. She's a mother of two daughters. One is a lawyer in Kenya, and the other works in international relationships. I would like you all to give first hold, but when I do bring on, give a resounding round of applause as she presents, because what I just told you is a synopsis of a CV which actually goes 21 pages and all qualified. Let's welcome our beloved sister as the keynote speaker for the Rise of Africa, Florence Tatu Amino. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon, everybody. I'm extremely honored to have this opportunity I hope my voice is a, you can hear, yeah? <laughs> Opportunity to address you in this prodigious moment in our Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. My topic 
of presentation is going to be African-European relation on economic opportunities, challenges, and the path. I'm going to read my speech. Okay. I'm going to read my speech, and at the same time, I want us to interact because in two or three pages, I cannot finish the issues, the challenges, and other good things we have in Africa. So I want both of us to contribute to, you know, to work together to see how what is there, who knows what, and how we can be able to understand these issues and continue to work together between Africa and Europe. Africa and Europe, the partnership through political and policy dialogue on an alternate basis which was held in Addis Ababa and Brussels. The last meeting was held in April 5th, 2015. The Africa-Europe relations that framed by the joint Africa Union and the European Union strategy which was adopted at an African and European Union summit in Lisbon in the year 2007, which was reaffirmed last year, that is 2015. The Roadmap 2014 and 2017 implement the strategy in the five areas of dialogue and cooperation, peace, security, democracy, good governance, human development, sustainability, human rights, and inclusive development, growth and content integration, global and emerging issues. When you talk of emerging issues, the issues which are in Africa at the same time, we have also some of them in Europe. It doesn't mean that we are in Europe, there are no issues. There are more issues just like, uh, that's what, from my experience for being here for the last six uh, wait, months, I've realized there are some more similar issues that uh, both continents faces. Africa is the European Union most important continent Development assistance from the year 2000 to 2013, inclusive of 2015. The official development assistance order disbursed to Africa by the European Union and its member states. It is estimated at around 144 billion euros, which is at around 20.6 billion euros average per year. The African the European Union and African Union hold a year human rights dialogue. The last one, which took place on 24th November in Rwanda, happened to the human rights year with the special focus on human rights with special focus on rights of a woman. The European Union agreed to support the UN, I mean the African Union within plan to expedite the trafication, the ratification of international and continental human rights instruments at the national level. Collectively, the European Union, including its member states in the African Union Commission main financial contributor, providing more than 80% of its budget. The European Union Commission alone provides approximately 1.7 billion euros to the African Union since 2004 until 2015. Cooperation between the African Union and the European Union Commission amount to 337 million euros. The cooperation mainly between the two, the AU and the EU, covers mainly peace and security operations, capacity building activities as well as cooperation programs and different areas. This includes EU member states, institutions, and implementation partners. This aim at renewing administrative operation between the two, the AU and the EU. This as well exchange and cooperation in a number of priorities areas of mutual interest. The challenges which faces the EU and the AU, I know there are so many challenges, but I'm going to name a few. African and Europe are long-standing partners as well as close partners. They share many of the same challenges as terrorism and present flow of people, economic and social development, migration crisis. This is why there's a need for continuity of fostering common activity to enable the two continents to continue working together for their common goals on tackling and combating international region and regional issues facing both of them. The new emerging opportunities and resources in 
African continent, such as mineral, gas, and oil in Mozambique, oil in Kenya, agribusiness in many parts of the our African continent, banking sector, real estate, among other upcoming opportunities in Africa continent. There is need for both continents to complement each other and work together to make sure these resources benefit both of them. The EU to assist on development of the new resource of the African continent. The joint venture between the EU and the AU will as well tackle the issues facing both continents, such as the issue of non-employment, which is also a challenge in Africa and Europe, social affairs, skills and labor mobility, humanitarian crisis, terrorism, among other major issues, with a focus on conflict resolution, peace, corruption, security, civil war, tribal clashes, and migration. The two continents should also focus on the need to issue sustainability of economic growth, development of the benefit of Africans and Europe relationship. That is my speech for today, and now I want us to interact to complete. That's as I said before I started. The issues we have both two continents, we cannot have them in a two-page. Thank you for your time and for listening. Well, one of the great things about cultural diplomacy, um, and I know that it's in another phase known as soft power, is it allows for the emerging or the synthesis of ideas. So what we're going to do with this one, and it's very innovative with this particular one. In any conference, when you come right after lunch, the blood normally seems to go to the stomach much more than to the head. So if you have more than a five page, 15, 20 minute you might all go into slumber, even though you're staying awake. So we're going to take this again, and we're going to engage everybody with this one. Put you pretty much, your neurons back into excitation, if that makes sense. You do have the presenter over here, and the topic that she did give was Africa-Europe relationships on economic opportunities, challenges, and the path. So we'll kick this off with challenges and the path in Africa-Europe relationships on economic opportunities. Definitely, as you do have the presenter over here, you, are, you can ask questions because it was a two-page presentation to just stimulate and start something up, or you can bring comments. We would, in the beginning, allow you to possibly go maybe three, four minutes, but we do have a lovely ICD rule. When you start to have a second presentation after a major presentation, then we'll culturally ask you to design the presentation so that others can share in. We all agreed on that. Okay. So I'll start it off in terms of, and I know I was going to be the second, but if I put anyone first, uh, you might panic. Or should I get someone to be first since I've spoken already? Any, any volunteers? I, I love that. I, I, I love that look. Okay. So <laughs> I'll start it off. And in the rise of Africa, and I'll start the first question with our esteemed guest. I think the microphone over there should be working. Okay. In the first thing that you would look in regards to African European partnership is sometimes you find an unvoid or an unbalanced partnership because most of Europe and Africa have come from what we would know the contemporary or the middle age phase of colonial dominance and colonized. So when you talk about a partnership, it may look unequal in, in 2016, even with democracy and human rights. Would we be able to put this back on an equal keel or is the overarching 
essence or stereotype of master and subject still a very culturally determining factor in the economic cooperation? And I'll pass this over to our beloved speaker to just open it up. And I know it might be a little exciting, but it, we're talking about partnership, or does the partnership have some weight where it favors one against the other? Thank you, doctor. In where I come from, we say daktari. That's Swahili, you know. That is the language we have in Kenya, we have in Mozambique to everybody has their own language, but that one is one so that East Africa we can communicate, we can talk, we can share. To my view, in this in unbalance as you had put it, balanced partnership, yeah, I think uh, as I was reading that one and that was my research, Yes, the European Union, they put money, yes, to this African Union. We appreciate in a way, yeah, but there are a few issues and challenges here and there that maybe they should be addressed. To my understanding, I don't think Africa needs more and more money. I think uh, we need uh, empowerment in a way. One, the issue of human rights. And maybe I should give one example of that as a lawyer. There was an issue which happened in my country, Kenya. And it was a big issue, it was a big scandal of billions of money. Including me and others, we took to the street because we needed answer. We needed, you know, the minister to resign. And we passed through all the embassies in Kenya, the foreign embassies. Because to me, the foreign embassies in the country, they are the part of the European Union, isn't it? According to my understanding. And to my, I think it's a shame because half of those embassies, they did not come out. Others, yes, we appreciate they came out and they said they need also answers, you know? Because when people took to the street, uh, the police were killing people and shooting people. which was not a good thing in the 21st century, you know. And I think we have a freedom of speech that we can, you know, as long as you're not abusing anybody, but you can exchange views, you can, you know. So they didn't come out, but I understand them. Some of them, they became casualties, you know, because the ambassadors, some of them were sent to Kenya to start working there, but they could not get anybody to sign their paper, so they were there like they were there, but they are not there. Because they need to be assigned, yeah? By the president for them to start working in a foreign country. So to me, I think either they were scared, or I don't know what came into their mind. I cannot dare say that they were part and parcel of the process. And people never got answers. People now, you see, an issue became another one because here we have people, young people and others who are short of something like that. And it's, now it became an issue of treating people, taking care of the issues. So these other issues, they just went underground. The only thing that we needed, we needed the minister, the ACS, to resign and give explanation. But to our surprise, The Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission, they cleared her. They cleared her. I don't understand how, because to me, she was part and parcel of the billions which was squandered. But they took to court some other business associate, they took to court some of the, the government's small officials or something like that. So to me, as a human rights defender, I don't think that was a good thing. And then, then when we talk about uh, the human rights issues, there was a lawyer also who was killed recently in Kenya by defending a client. A lawyer was not doing anything, he was defending his client. And he was killed by the police. In a police station, that's a big shame, in a police station. He was judged when he left the court and he was put in and just because he made an application in court, how the police shot his clients. 
So I think these are the issues that need to be addressed. As much as, yes, we are putting money, we are doing all that, but, and there are so many other issues. We still have the issues of nepotism, which, why we have the ancient clashes, because just because others, they feel they're being favored because others are not. But when you go down to the, it's not like that. So these are the things we need to put in place. We need all of us to contribute to it and see how we can be able to work on that. And uh, to mention, but I don't want to mention some other countries also up to date in the 21st century. When people have issues or they take to the street, because why should people take to the street? Because they have viewed their, you know, they have given their views, shares their problems and issues. The issue is not the public or the community want somebody to give them bread. You know, don't give a woman bread, but at least give, you know, or fish. Give them a net to fish. And this is what we should address. And even the issue of the European Union giving money for administrative and what. Yes, we appreciate that, but I think there are more issues. Why should we have tribal clashes? That means that, because this is what we are facing in Africa. There are more of tribal clashes than the terrorism issue, which people don't, they do it. There was another case in Kenya where people were killed in Lamu. The ambassador of Ethiopia, I don't know, because I think uh, he mentioned something of that. And why there was this problem, why people were killed? The reason is people, the community were never involved on this new port which is being built in Lamu of the Sudan and Ethiopia and whatever. Yes, the government is doing that maybe in a good heart, you know, to share, to do that so that maybe we can have business between the three countries. But the community, they have to know because this is my land. Maybe I was born here, I might not have a... That is the issue. I might not have a title, but this is where my great-grandparents were born. So this is where I call home. And what? I come and maybe I'm being removed and because there's development for the government. I will not understand. I need someone to explain to me why I have to be moved. Just like in the rural area, you tell them you want to build a road. They look at you. Why? Because they feel they want a a health center where I'm sick, I'll go there, be treated. But when you build a road, I don't have a, you know, I don't have a car, so how is that my business? But you need to explain, you need people to involve people. In every decision making, people need to be involved from the grassroots, the other level that they can be able to know and know how, why I should be moved, why I have to pave way, you know, maybe I'll be paid some small money by the government from my land or something like that to be able to pave way so that we can have this development. As we look at it, yes, it's going to benefit the three countries and the, you know, the strengthening of East Africa, but still we need to know. We need to know this. Another small issue I can say that on also I participated because these things I'm talking about is something that I've been involved in to work, to research and do. The issue of Kenya and Tanzania, because that is East Africa. Since time in memorial, we used to do business between East Africa and Kenya. We used to cross over, you know. But the Tanzanians, to be sincere, at the moment, everybody knows they're very hostile to Kenya. The truth we should say, we should talk. So that, you know, talking is the healing process. Why? Because they feel maybe they are coming to take up their jobs, they're coming, you see, to take up their jobs or something, and that is not the case, you know. So they need also to understand why. In Kenya, we paved way a long time ago, I think four years now, since the, the East Africa community came up, for the Tanzanians lawyer to come and practice in Kenya. But I bet you now, up to date, Four years we are still waiting as the Kenyan lawyer to be given a go ahead to practice in Tanzania. So these are the issues we need to, you know, because you are my neighbor or you are my sister or something, we need to live together, we need to be together and do things together. But we need also to know, and sometimes also there's misinformation, there's misguidance also from the political era, you know. 
So these are the things. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but I think uh, I've touched some of them. Well, it'll be to the participants. Um, definitely, she's kicked off the conversation. I'll, I'll put another one in, and then I think we'll get things rolling. We're talking about economic opportunities, challenges, and the path forward. So what I'd like to do, and we'll, we'll take, as soon as I finish, I'll this. What I'd like to do is, undoubtedly, we've spoken about the African experience, but we can't deny that from the last 500 or 600 years, Europe, in whatever way or fashion, has got its act together to structure institutions and ways of doing things. We're not saying it's all perfect, but they've been able to move forward and have things accomplished. Give an example. Uh, Ghana uh, used to be a leading country in cocoa. That's as far back as the early 20th century. Ghana still produces two primary products out of cocoa, which would be the chocolate and the cocoa butter. Malaysia came over to Ghana to learn the cocoa industry. I was in Ghana three years ago. Malaysia produces 50 products from the same cocoa bean. So we must begin to question what is happening in the midst of the opportunities, like you did say, 170 billion. What is happening within those and the opportunities thereof that keeps Africa or holding the potential of Africa from rising? Are you all with me so far? And it can't just be money, because money is printed. If we're going to take money, and I'll cut this off here, all of the world economy right now, especially in the Western world, is instituting an instrument called quantitative easing. That's in Europe and in America, which means just paper money is being funneled into the economy, which doesn't have any collateral in economic indices. It's just to sustain cash flow. So paper money or wealth is not really what will get into Africa, which would stir up the corruption. But it is known also that in the mineral resource of Africa alone, that if the whole continent of Africa shut down the exportation of its mineral resource, the six major stock exchanges in the world in a week would crash. So they must be, we must talk about this because if you aren't able to address this, there's one thing about moving forward, which is cognitive dissonance. If you aren't able to take responsibility of your challenges, like the lawyer came, you can't go forward. Africa's 3,000 unique cultural groups, the most diverse on the whole continent, even China, with 1.4 billion, has only 16 cultural groups. This is on the statistics of the Eco Economist and St. James Street in London. Africa's 3,000 and was producing phenomenally prior to 1442. So with everything in Africa's favor, What's holding Africa back from the great goodwill that is being pumped into Africa to allow it to go up and forward? And then I'll take your question. We had, we had a comment over there. So I'm just throwing the proverbial conversation, cat among the pigeons, so I'll get everybody stimulated. Would you... Would you um, thank you and, so much. And what I'd like you to do for the great family, this is day one. Or have I missed a day? <laughs> this day one. So if you can kindly introduce yourself. We won't do it like the classroom. Where you're from, just a brief synopsis so everybody will know about you. And then you can bring your, your question or your comment. Yeah, OK. My name is Linda. I come from Kenya. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Thank you, Florence, for the um, stim you're asking questions that are stimulating our, our minds. Um, you mentioned something about uh, Tanzania-Kenya cooperation and how Africa should learn more to cooperate with each other because, as you mentioned, there are so many resources which we could possibly be taking for granted. And I was talking to, I've been talking, thinking and talking to my mother about some of this stuff. And the Pope came to Kenya this year. The um, the president of the United States came to Kenya this year. There must be something that these people are seeing that we Africans are failing to see. Exactly. So how is it that we can cooperate? How is it that we can use cultural diplomacy to learn about each other? I know Tanzanians are nice people. They're kind people. They are 
that they are that giving and you know but that's all i know i know nigerians are loud and crazy i know south africans are a bit rude well <laughs> that's all i know i'm sorry i don't mean to attack but that's you see mind, those yeah? those are things those are the misconceptions we have in our mind just j just, just allow her to make her unalloyed comments because yeah. it's her perspective it doesn't have to be, be true. what you accept but yeah. we'll be very diplomatic with it. But cultural diplomacy, you don't have to agree, but at least you know where she's coming from. So when we engage in the next two days, you'll be able to upgrade her on the deficit she may have about the wonderful South Africans. And I don't mean to attack any, anyone. I apologize. You're doing well. Any... You're doing well. OK. Yeah. So these are the misconceptions we have in Africa about each other. So what tools, what are the channels, for example, education, what are the channels that we can use to educate each other culturally to, to, so that we can cooperate better? There's a point over there. What are the channels, education being the root? So again, most of you here have been to university or you've studied, at least you've gone past uh, nursery school, haven't you? OK, so education. So uh, lawyer. Africa's had education ever since the missionaries came on in. Yeah. And it's had education before the missionaries came on in. In fact, it's known that um, Africa used to produce steel before Sheffield produced steel. So it's what kind of education you have, because education determines the way you think. So could the current education have set a mindset where the African has become, unfortunately, dependent and waiting for someone to help him? rather than going out and creating an environment? Or is the leadership over there who are also educated, the map of the political Africa so disconnected from the map of the greater cultural Africa that it's not able to extract that human potential and genius to move forward? Is there a disconnect? Because all education may not cause rise. Some education just makes you literate in what you're educated in, but it doesn't make you literate in African affairs. Most of the education you may have had is Euro literacy. So you're skilled in how to articulate and analyze European problems. But when it comes to analyzing African issues, you're using the wrong tools in being able to separate them and reconstruct them for potential. So we can't use education as a blanket statement. We may have to unpackage what education helps people. The Chinese have a unique educational system. And after their crash in 1920, China is now poised to become a dominant economic factor in the world. World. But we know it's not Western education. They have a craft that has worked for them also India. So we're trying to unpackage this. And I know I might have set a few PhD and, uh, you know, master's students, but it's part of the discussion. Gentlemen over here. Let me first leave with a lady. Uh, hello. My name is Nadia. I'm from Kenya. Pleased to meet you, <laughs> Nadia. We've got a whole lot of Kenyans. And you missed out. The royal family also goes to Kenya. That's where they make their engagements. Yes. So there's something we're missing over there, brothers. Uh, so you asked what stops uh, Africa from rising. Yeah. And I'll say it's the perception Africans have of, OK, as much as the EU, the Western world, they come to Africa, they help us, they give us money and all sorts of stuff, but they sell dreams to us. And when I say dreams, I mean they come there and they show us all these things that, you know, and they kind of convince us that when you come to our country or when you come on the other side, life is better, life is easier, you know, you'll earn more, you'll do this. So a lot of Africans, we get caught up in this net where we think, like I can say Kenyans, we don't like going back home. Like I'm, I come from Mombasa. So whenever I tell my mom and my dad that, you know, once I'm done with my masters, I'm coming back home and I want to do this and that, my parents look at me like I'm crazy. Because they're like, oh, in Kenya, what are you going to do? There's no opportunities. There's no this. And this is the kind of you know, ideology, mentality. that mentality that people have. And I, I believe it's not only in Kenya. It's also all over Africa. Mm -hmm. So I think when the European <laughs> Union or the Western countries are coming to help Africa, they should also bear in mind that you don't want to pull people out. You want to educate them. And you know you want to ground them and convince them that you know Africa is the place to be because let's all be honest, Africa is the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
We have um, a gentleman here, and then we've got a lady over there. There, there is, and correct me before the gentleman comes on, there is a narrative about the beauty of Kenya and uh, aid. I think you do have a great writer who's written a book, Dead Aid, very um, influential writer. But I hear that when any aid organization is coming into Kenya, they are so skilled. As Soon as the plane touches down, if it's Oxfam, everybody in Kenya wears an Oxfam t-shirt. And as soon as Oxfam leaves, if it's Save the Children, everybody wears Save the Children t-shirt because it's lobbying for that fun pot. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Francis Adams from Ghana. What stops Africa from rising, I think, is lack of cultural diplomacy. And this started from the very early days that the white man stepped foot on the African continent. We all know clearly in the history of Africa at which point the African um, culture, our tradition, was attacked and heavily destroyed by two steps. That is the, in the name of religion and colonization. What happened was that it was a strategy. All that uh, our colonial masters and really in the name of religion, actually I'm a Christian, I believe in everything that is good, you know. But what they started was this. One, colonial, uh, our colonial masters did not establish education for our benefit, but they established it for business, the sake of business. So to, just to talk, to understand, that was why these, all these uh, systems were established, not to develop our environment, but just to communicate. And if you are starting anything in the name of business, you are rather interested in your benefits. That is it. Now, when the religious came in, the Christians landed, they did something a bit extra. That was the beginning of modern uh, technical vocation we had in Africa. You know, they said, it. why? Because they were people that were planning to stay a bit. So they trained people, cut keys, carpenters, to repair their things. Like, all that I'm saying is that the main reason why we have lagging behind is coming from the fact that our culture, our tradition was completely, completely disintegrated. And now we cannot go back to just pick it as it was. While it has been disintegrated, we need cultural diplomacy to kind of like pick up the pieces together and see how quick and sustainable we can really put them together. So I think if this is not done, but strategically, I think these things will keep repeating and repeating and repeating. Thank you very much. I'm going to, I'm going to, pick, I'm going to pick an issue and then I'll bring the lawyer in. That you said that our downward trend in Africa started on the advent of the European coming because of its economic interests. Um, is the August audience paying attention? I'm going to pick this up. So what happened to the nations of Ghana, Timbuktu, and uh, Songhai, who had so much gold prior to the establishment of Gold Coast Ghana, and they disintegrated all those civilizations? Because the white man or the European only appeared on the coast of Africa in 1442, Prince Henry the Navigator. So something must have been a downward trend even before he came there. And we can't keep using that point of 1442. He just accelerated it because we are more vulnerable, but we had already started the downward trend. And then post-1957, if everybody's listening, when Africa got its first independence, we still have not gone upwards. We still have continued on the downward trend. So he's left, deal with your matters, and we're still in that. So I'm not saying he may not have a role in it, but historically, I won't put all the burden on the Europeans stepping on the coast of Africa being the downfall of Africa. I, I, I really won't do that because classical history would not bear a testimony to that. But we'll have a discussion about that. But I just want to, just in case somebody feels that's where it started, there are other nations and empires that fell before we got even to 1442. You wanted to make a point? Yeah, maybe to to add to something about there is something called economic exploitation. And I am going to give a study case that also I'm involved with that case and it's still, I think it's going to be one of the biggest cases in this world because we are suing Britain for trillions of sterling pounds. Reason being, in Kenya, there's Kericho. 
Kericho is one of the places in Kenya which produces the best tea, actually, worldwide. After independence, when the British went away, after we got our independence, they returned, the, the, you know, we used to call the Lord's Mayors. They had chunks and chunks of our land where they used to do agribusiness from that time. But they never returned this land, the Kericho land, the tea plantation, actually, as they called it. They've made it like their own home. That is where they live. That is where they still do the farming of tea. They export this tea international. I don't want to mention, but most of the biggest teas that we know in this world come from that point. And what they did, one, they never returned the land as the peace treaty which was done you know, after independence. One, they never returned. Two, the people who are working there and the lower management, I mean people, you know, the casual labor and what, they are Kenyans, but the management people, they are people from, from Europe. They come and manage, you know. So I don't know, maybe to the understanding they are the best managers, but to me, no. Reason being why I did a research with a team, actually, I'm the one who started this issue, and now we are suing them. One, they never did any development in Kericho, even a small dispensary, yeah, but still there. And they don't pay tax to Kenya. They pay their tax in, in Europe. So what is our interest? They're getting billions and billions of sterling pounds, you know, yearly, and what are we getting? What is the interest of the people? What is the interest? So these are the things, the issues that, and when I started to have this case, many people thought, oh, it was a dream, but I'm happy. Karim Khan, I think we all know, is one of the, you know, and two other, the Queen Council, they're called the Queen Council, they came in and they're offering this for free which would have paid them billions and billions and you're working on. And I still had the, the research in five countries, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. I got, we got documents from, I don't know what centuries, how they did in these African countries. When you look at them, and these are the next years and the evidence, because in court it's about an and evidence, you know. We are, we are going to, actually we are already started the process, we are annexing these people, these documents which were in the archives. Some even of them, the people didn't know that they existed. And all these East African countries, they did the same. The same story that happens there, that is how they, they did it. But how many people, you see, to me, that is economic exploitation. Because you still have thousands of thousands over our land, which you got for free, actually, because they never bought. According to them, they invented the land, but I don't understand because we have tribes according to our country in Kenya, they are tribes. When I tell you I'm this, I know she's from this place. When I tell you I'm this name, I know she's... So all these places, they were people even before they came. So the issue of them inventing the land, I don't understand because they were people at that time, the chiefs and everybody, and you know, at that time we used to call the headmans, you know, the village elders, yeah? We were operating on our own way Yes, we didn't have maybe the system that they came and put in place, but you see this thing. So this is going to be a landmark case, and we are yet to see. Let's watch our back on this, because nobody wanted to touch them because they come and do some few project funds here and there, and people feel that, oh, they are doing something, but we said no. I said, I think something is wrong. You cannot take my farm, my land, plant the, you know, this agribusiness. They are called the cash crop because they cash, you know. You take them to your country and then you pay taxes to your country and what is my interest? It's a small token of casual laborers who, you know, who work there. It doesn't work like that. So I think Africa, we should be able to tackle such issues, know how we are going to, instead of even having the tribal clashes, look at um, this tribe, you're that one. And this is how we do in Africa, most of, you know, Ah, he's from Ghana. Ah, okay. Oh, he, she's from... Ta no, people should come together. Because the moment, you know, they sh we should not apply the rule and divide, you know, divide and rule tactics. When we come together, we open our minds and see how we are going, how these issues... Because we have more issues within us, like this, and I'm very sure other countries, after our case, other countries also in Africa will come. The way he was talking about cocoa. And I think many things... This in... Um, 
in law, we call a president. So as Kenya, we are setting a president for this, against Britain for this case. So I think other people also, they are going to come because it doesn't work like that. And still you continue saying they are poor people, we need to, you take millions from us and then you bring a small aid and you say you are, it doesn't work like that. As I said, I used to work for Save the Children Canada. Yeah, as a legal advisor, going round, popularizing the New Children Act, which I fought for it, going through the street and sleeping down, until we got it from the UN Convention, Rights of a Child. We ended up with the Kenya, you know, the Children Act. But why I had to leave my full paid job and all the nice things, because I felt some projects were making our people more poor. They had a project where I used to work in a place called Timau. They had around 3,000 households that they are assisting. A man and a man, you know, a husband and wife and two children. So their money is cut at food for every month. There's a you know, budget for food every month. There's a budget for health insurance and all those things. And rent and all that. But they never told these people, this project is for a certain period. These people need to be empowered, not to be given. And every month they used to come to the office, these 3,000 family household, they come, they take their money, you know, or some are put into their accounts of which they were, I told them they're making my people so, and I mobilized the community, I'm a very good mobilizer anyway. I mobilized the community and the project was stopped. And even with their partners in America, I don't want to mention them, but they were there, there's an organization from America. Reason being, I have two children who are paid everything for, so do I need to go wake up and do anything for myself? No, I'll continue having more babies because if I'm getting this money, I don't cook many, I cook one pot in the house. So if I cook this pot, even the other children will eat from the same pot. So I'm fine, I'm okay. So these are the things, I think as much as yes, but Africa don't think we need, we need this kind of things, you know. We need also to understand, we need also to have to make this thing understand. And also the cultural diplomacy, that's when we talk about the cultural diplomacy comes in so that we can understand why are we fighting. The terrorists and what comes just the other day when we started, yeah? But the tribal clashes have been there, the civil war and all that. Why should a brother kill a brother? Because of something which is not even there. So I think there's a, there's a question yeah. over there. What I'd like to do it on, the, I, on the end half of this, and we'll take the question from the, there's a lady yes. over there and then you've got one. Uh, okay. I'd like us now to move into opportunities because we can continue until the chickens come home to roost on what the problem is. But I know all of you did not really come here to hear problems because you all have your own to carry. So now let's start to have the conversation after the lady. And now let's start putting some things in place about what are the opportunities that we can both grasp moving forward. And possibly if we grasp the opportunities enough, we'll be able to outmaneuver the stumbling blocks of what we perceive as problems. Lady. Okay, we'll, we'll take one and then after her I we'll was take just, you. I would like to comment. I am from, I'm Maria from Lebanon. And uh, i just like to notice something about Africans uh, in the continent of Africa. In general, I think that all the funds, the European funds that goes to Africa to help Africa were not Good, um, uh, let's Good say. Good investments? Yes. No, I, I think that Africans didn't know how to use them. Or between them, they don't collaborate or cooperate together. For example, I'm from Lebanon. And you know, there is a lot of Lebanese in Africa that invest and a lot of businessmen as well. So the first. The first uh, word that when I see, for example, a Senegali or a, um, from a people from Ghana, or they said, you Lebanese take our economy, take our business. And I just like, <laughs> this is funny, but I like to say that why, why Lebanese people that came from, the, from, from Lebanon to, to Africa to invest and work and make businesses African, the African themselves didn't do it before. 
So that's the main question. Why, why they didn't cooperate together? Why they didn't found the, the work before Lebanese found them or other than Lebanese? And I would like also to comment about something that the governments in Africa are not, are not helpful. Let's say that not all of the countries are uh, democracies. So there is a lot of corruption. There is a lot of, uh, um, um, I don't know why I use the... Nepotism. Yes, yes, because uh, there is big, rich, a lot of money, a lot of gold, a lot of oil in Africa that is not used for the for the interest of Africa itself. So this money is going with governments that are African in the same time and they are co cooperating, for example, with big uh, commerce and uh, businessmen from Europe or America or uh, the United States to take this money away from Africans. And we 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 remark that this we did use that the whole population, the African population is still too poor to 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 know that uh, that they can profit from this uh, from this richness from these resources as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to just take a point that you said. Um, in terms of the Lebanese involvement in Africa and the great Lebanese involvement in Africa, for the gentleman who comes from Ghana, you've got a lot of Lebanese in Ghana. Mokazo, um, all the cinema halls are owned by them. The uh, moto spare parts industries, they ha have those. Uh, they've done a great job over there. Um, brilliant job. So they, they might be, they might be uh, esteemed participants. They might be a cultural vulnerability and a political vulnerability that partners are taking advantage of. And if we are partners and there is a vulnerability in terms of opportunities, then it may seem in, t in looking at human rights that we would begin to strengthen those vulnerabilities and not decade after decade, century after century, exploit the vulnerability of a people who are sitting on natural resources. We may have a partnership moving forward. The second thing, we talk about democracy, and it's a very loose political construct. I think we really don't have no strong democratic example on the earth still today. Whether in America, uh, Theresa May in London made a speech yesterday, and there's a whole lot of uh, storming a teacup in London, but we still don't have a strong example of democracy as the Greeks thought about it. But if we're taking democracy as strong leadership, every time Africa demonstrates strong leadership, it is undermined by a foreign interest. And I can go on from Gaddafi to Kwame Nkrumah to Patrice Lumumba to the individual over in Ivory Coast. Every time there is strong leadership, the only strong leadership in Africa that was not undermined was Julius Nyerere. But any time there is strong leadership, whether it's democratically based or not, there is an undermining because the political map and the economic interests are always at a variance. So we would have to have another kind of thing that supports strong leadership that is in the interest of a people towards partnership. But let's talk about opportunities. You had your hand up. Uh, before that, we have a short comment from this side on the same point, and after that, we'll continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Catherine. Obaitan. I'm from Nigeria. Thank you, Catherine, from yeah. Nigeria. Lord Lugard's um, country where divide and rule became the initial strategy <laughs> of creating the great Nigeria of 170 million. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to, um, like, even though I know right now we've moved on to, like, solutions, but I want to first give a quick point before I give, building on what you just said, before I give my own idea of what we, measures we can take to, like, move ahead to resolve the problem. Before you go on, is everybody... Um, Getting involved in this, is this worth the while? Is it helping the digestive process? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to start a fight or start a war. You but can, I it's think... still cultural diplomacy. There are diplomats <laughs> in the room. But I think uh, really one major problem of, I think I should stand up because he requires, one major That's problem. The passion. Yeah, one major problem is um, Africans. 
we have this victim mentality, like move on for crying out loud. Like no one owes anyone in Africa anything. We're always talking about aid this and aid that and they want to give us money, give us money. No one really owes Africa anything. Like we should move on from that. Like it's, it's, it's I feel that um, we, for you to be treated, you have to tell people the way they will treat you. Like we always want to say, oh, okay, we are poor, give us money. We know you are, we, we are poor. We know, we know we have these issues, but we always play the victim and feel that, okay, people owe us something. Yeah, the more developer, they owe us something because we are not as developed and da 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 da, da. Yeah, like move on. It's old. We have young people. We have people doing great things. We have Africans doing great things, but no one wants to go to Africa because we don't give ourselves the opportunity to develop. And we still play that victim. Yeah, we were colonized. Yeah, we, <laughs> it's been ages, like, you know. 400 like, years ago. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, and even till now, even the most educated people go, presidents go on stage and they talk about, uh, yeah, they are doing this to Africa, and you are doing that. Like, what year is this? This is 2016. You are still talking about what happened, and you are still, you know, I just feel it's like still just, you know, let's move on. Can you imagine the news report in 2016 if we don't change the course? Ex of it's still the same thing. You will still be moaning about how they colonized you and how they are still cheating you and stuff. And you still be relying on aid. You know, we feel that the world owes us something. No one owes anybody anything. Like Europeans, they are trying to develop themselves. Why not you try to do something for yourself with what you have? You know, okay, then my point, how I feel we can um, resolve the issue is building on what you just said about strong governance. I feel that one major problem of, Afri of Africa is that there are no... Um, Let's use the word challenge, because problem normally is traumatic. Okay. Mm. One major prob challenge, challenge, sorry. <laughs> One major challenge of Africa is the fact that are, we don't have, like, strong institutions put in place to check people. Like, for example, we all um, weep about corruption in Africa. People are corrupt everywhere. People are corrupt every single place. But because um, com if, we, if, we, sh if we, we should learn from what's... Um, other countries that are successful are doing, they put in place strong institutions and strong organizations to check people. I don't want to, like, people, n as human beings, we are not inclined to obey. We are inclined to disobey. But once you know there's a check, okay, let me give this. Someone was saying this, like, a few days ago, that why is it that Africans in Africa behave a different way, and when they come to Europe, they behave another way? Because they know that, okay, in Africa, I can do anything and get away with it, you know. But you know that you should behave, you should respect yourself. My people will say, borrow a brain and a half when you come to Europe. Borrow a brain and a half, that's like, respect yourself. So I feel that we should put in place, one way going forward, we should put in place measures to check people, you know, put in place organizations and put in place structures, you know, to check things going on in Africa. And I think my last point is... Um, yeah, you also said something about education. People that are, that, like the young people, they don't want to go back. Like people come abroad, you know, come out yeah. to be educated and no one wants to really go back because you're like, yeah, nothing really happens. Yeah, we know the people that have been ruling are still ruling, but if no one goes back to do something then, like you said, 3016 is still going to be the same. So put in place measures to check people and um, I feel we should just do it ourselves, yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like you all, if you have a moment, those of you on Facebook, to go into a, a page on Facebook called The Ascension of Africa, and you see a different picture of Africa over there, the potential, not only those in the diaspora, but those in Africa who are doing things. Ghana is right now on the verge of producing cars. There are about four or five African countries that are putting cars together. The richest man in Africa, who is much more richer than the Oppenheimers, in South Africa is Dankote, Nigeria. The rich, richest woman in Africa is also from Nigeria. So we talk about rich. We talk about wealth, rich, and institutions. So perceptions can change, but it's got to be structured in such a way where we're seeing opportunities and we're collaborating on opportunities moving forward. We're missing out this uh, beautiful lady over here, and it looks like a lot of beautiful lady, you know, but she was the fourth in line. Let's do something for cultural diplomacy. If you can allow her to speak, because I don't want the fifth person to go, and then she loses her point. I'm coming back. You know, and then we'll definitely okay. come back to you. Please, yes. even if you just say thank you for giving us the microphone, that will be culturally <laughs> effective. <laughs> okay. Thank you for giving me the microphone. Um, <laughs> so... Um, I wouldn't totally agree that Africa has not been a victim of the 21st century and the Western world. Um, 
I still believe that the Western world takes a huge part in um, taking potential regarding economic development, especially in agriculture. I wrote my thesis on the livestock industry um, in Germany and what it also does to African local markets. And um, the Western economy produces, overproduces, for example, meat and um, exports the so-called waste, which we don't want to eat, to Africa. And we destroy the local markets um, over there by offering lower prices than um, farmers can offer in the local markets. So I guess to um, get to solutions, um, they are right over here. They are, well, some of them. <laughs> Um, we can start in the European Union with the whole agricultural treaty we have um, to change this, to stop um, subventions, is that what you call it? Um, to stop supporting overproduction and destroying local markets in Africa. So it's not only in Africa where the solutions are, they're also definitely here in the Western world and the politics here have to change to give the opportunity to Africa to, to, um, to get their potential in, in this world, in this globalized world. Yeah. Hold the mic a moment. You wrote a thesis on this. Yes. Okay, let me ask a question and you can educate all of us. In the political map, of Europe or any country. The political map is not normally supported by political ideology. It's supported by economic interest. Every politician has to have an economic backer, which actually puts them in power. What you're saying is actually the economic interests overriding the political will. So if Europe itself, and Angela Merkel just quite recently has, she's beginning to adjust certain positions after the migration um, over in UK. How is it able, how is Europe able, even though it's democratic, to be able to mute the economic overbearance which puts the politicians in power? Because I remember Rothschild or someone said over in France in the 19th century that give me the control of the economics and I don't, I'm not worried about who makes the laws. And I feel even today, as we see Donald Trump and others still vying for Western democratic leadership, it's the economic interest that you say is very incipient or inimical to the African continental growth that dominates these same benefactors that are supposed to be helping them. So if we start here, and in 2016, they've not still been able to put a check to the economic lobby controlling political positions, then where do we go from that point? And that's something, because you wrote your thesis, I want to see if you analyzed that. Um, let me think. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, first of all... I'll help you out. In America, they've just dumped a whole lot of cherries because of overproduction. But they've dumped a whole lot of cherries to import cheaper cherries from another country. That's a political decision. And they've produced... These are not... African, these are American farmers producing cherries, but because of political interest, they have to dump their cherries so a cheaper cherries come into America. Yeah, well, the lobbyism, right? So, um, yeah, the only thing I can think of right now is that um, there needs to be a, a huge movement, a voice against lobbyism, a more, um, uh, yeah. There. You're doing well, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm missing the words, I'm That's sorry. Okay. You're doing Whenever well. Whenever I have the mic in the hand, it's like... It's okay. It's gone. Um, yeah, so, so I guess we can, we can only start by, by raising awareness. Um, I mean, who in this room knew um, that the overproduction of meat is destroying local markets in Africa? Like, who, do, who does, there is no, even in, in Germany, there is not enough awareness, not enough education um, that actually informs the people of what lobbyism actually does to politics, politics and 
and other countries, how it, how it does do, how it harms other countries and the development of other countries. Um, I guess it's a lot of, it's an awareness problem and if, if people were more aware of this, I guess there, there would be more potential in changing it. What we are doing in this discussion is not only answering, but you're beginning to see the different minds in your midst beyond, hello, how are you? So that we can network. All conferences in the 21st century, the solutions don't begin and end in the conference. It's the after-conference networking that empowers, drives, and brings a movement towards what we expect in a conference. So don't expect that we're going to answer the whole world. But spot those who are answering things. Get with them. Have a further conversation. And then when you leave, continue the conversation. Because it's the stronger network that affects why you came here. Now to the, another lovely lady. Hello, my name is Christine and I'm from Tanzania. Hello, uh, Christy from Tanzania. I want to make a comment uh, because I get a lot of questions from European, uh, my friends in Europe, and they ask me, why is Africa still poor? Why we get, they get a lot of fund? Well, actually, the fund that the European countries or Western country gives Africa goes to our politicians. It doesn't even go to the people in Africa. So that's why it only targets even like 0.9%. So it doesn't really benefit the Africa. It actually make our politician more corrupt. And another thing which I want to address is um, she mentioned that Tanzania is actually blocking a lot of Kenyans and business and stuff like that. Um, actually, even Kenyans are doing the same thing. It's just that you know one country can block one thing from another country and welcome other things. So I don't think so. Tanzania really have bad intentions with Kenyans. It's just that um, it's, it's their geopolitics exactly protecting their interests. Yeah, and another thing, um, the East African community and African community. I feel like those communities will never function well because most countries in Africa, they have a lot of tribal issues. So the countries in Africa need to resolve their own tribal problems before they can ask for community with other countries. So yeah, that's... Let me ask you a question. <laughs> never is something that I really find a difficult in cultural diplomacy. Well, they, with all their issues, they functioned well under the same colonial master because they all functioned well supporting the same colonial master. So at least they functioned well. So if they were able to do it, why can't they take that same discipline with the absence of the colonial master and interact together? That's just something I'm going to put up because in functioning well, it's about functioning. They functioned very well for the interest of their colonial master and they did a good job, both religiously, economically and academically. So now the colonial master says, I'm now going to allow you to do what you are doing for me for yourselves. And all of a sudden, it's not working. I'll tell you one thing, and I know you're all going to laugh. They call something, it's one of the greatest degrees that has happened in the world. It's, in, it's an African cliche to it, it's called a PhD, and it's called pull him or her down. 